Thank you, Sarah, and the board of directors and all the staff for hosting me. It's just, it is, I cannot tell you what an honor it is to finally be here. Um, I was introduced to you guys through Patrick Valentino, who is my long-term mentor and a huge fan of yours. And a lot of you don't know here, but EWC helped us become our own uh, independent nonprofit uh, by supporting us and asking, acting as our fiscal sponsor while we went through the transition. Uh, be, a program under Cal Wolf Center to kind of struggling on our own to finally becoming our own nonprofit. So a little bit of a history there, super grateful. You guys do amazing work. I'm so impressed. I always have been and today through the tour was really amazing. Um, so it is an honor. And you know, I hope that what I have to offer today is helpful to the work that you do in some way, um, maybe now or maybe in the future. So just a little bit quick background, Sarah kind of talked about it. You know, I don't come from a wolf background. A lot of you here probably have a lot more experience than I ever did. I mean, my degree is in marine science and I, my whole thing is about the water. Grew up Laguna Beach, California, swam in the ocean, worked with marine mammals, you know, except for my horse. It was always about the water and I was gonna do that forever until one day went on a tour at California Wolf Center and my world was forever, ever changed and I'm grateful. But through those early experiences, I think I was really fortunate because I was exposed to a lot right off the bat. <laughs> you know, had neat opportunities to go out in the field, uh, to do field work, uh, to travel, to go to hearings, to learn about the education and outreach. And it really inspired me to want to do more. So I was re really lucky in that regard. So I encourage any of you to always take advantage of any opportunity to experience new things. You just never know how your eyes might be open to a new way of looking at things. And so for that reason, um, I feel like I was very fortunate. And through my journey, starting you know, on the stakeholder working group and through that meeting ranchers, <laughs> um, you know, working circle was formed. And the vision for it began actually in 2014 when it was a program under California Wolf Center. And then it was founded in partnership with ranchers in California and in Southern Oregon. It was kind of their vision of, okay, you know, if we're gonna look at coexistence, it's kind of always been led by, you know, environmental groups, you know, this is our lives, you know, let's, let's do this together, you know. So we formed it in partnership with them and uh, it has continued since and it's been, again, a really incredible journey uh, for me personally. Um, so who we are, just briefly, you know, we are dedicated to wolves. I mean, I am a hardcore wolf advocate. <laughs> I believe they have an inherent right to be on this landscape for sure. Um, but the work we do is kind of taking it through the back door, so to speak, right? Because um, I'm not a rancher. <laughs> um, but we are dedicated to coexistence, wolf, livestock, and people and supporting ranchers directly on the ground in the context where wolves live. The reason why I bol uh, bulleted number two is because that's what we're gonna kinda be focusing on today in my talk. So I wanted to kinda share that with you. Um, but you know, really the core of what we do is about building relationships. I know a lot of us didn't get into you know, animal work or science to deal with people. A lot of animal people, science people don't wanna deal with people. But the fact is, um, it really, the people part is the magic behind what can make this happen and what makes it happen. And that's the lesson I learned. You know, it's interesting because I wasn't ever really that much of a people person, but <laughs> after working in the ranching community and through this experience, um, now I am, and it's been extremely rewarding. Um, but anyways, those are, you know, kind of the general things that we uh, focus on. And you can see again, that yes, it's very ranch specific, and there's been a lot of groups that go, you know, I don't get it. You know, you're supposed to be wolf advocate, but everything you do is about ranching. Yep, it is because I love wolves and talk about that again in a few minutes. Um, because we don't believe that wolves have to exist at the expense of ranching and ranching does not have to exist at the expense of wolves. It doesn't have to be one or the other and they don't have to be in conflict with each other. And what we've learned is that each can actually benefit each. And that's kind of the magic. So if we work together <laughs> instead of against each other, we can really um, come a long way in building those bridges surrounding wolf conservation and sustainable ranching. And so that's what, what gets me really excited. So anyways, let's look back a little bit in order to look forward. I love this quote. But you know, if you look back at the early pioneers of conservation, you know, we can see as humans how far we've come 
in our mindset about conservation and how much we've learned and evolved over the years. I mean, we all come from different backgrounds, different skill sets, different perspectives, different expertise, and it takes all of us, rather you're working on the legal side, political side, wolf recovery <laughs> side, coexistence side, it takes all of us to make this work. Um, you know, and coexistence is just one of the facets involved in this. It's just one of the pieces of the puzzle, but it's an important one, obviously, right? And so that's where I have focused on. And coexistence is often really oversimplified. You know, you often hear, well, gosh, it's not that hard for ranchers to live with wolves, or just, it's just, you know, part of the business, right? They just have to accept it, or just put up flattery, or just do this. Well, <laughs> it's not that simple. Um, and that is something we really need to um, recognize. Um, it's complicated, but there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of promise. And I guess I'm hoping that, even though I'm not an expert you know, in anything, <laughs> but I am going to speak from my own experiences and what I've learned um, in this work. So again, going back to history, so we can look at where we are today. If you think about it, when wolves were first introduced to the greater Yellowstone area, gosh, nearly 30 years now, um, and talking to folks like Carter Niemeyer and others that were there, <laughs> you know, they talk about how you know, no one could truly predict what was to come. The tremendous, overwhelming celebration across the nation about what was happening with wolves coming back and the ter tremendous uh, challenges that came with it. <laughs> um, the tremendous divisive controversy, the turmoil in the ranching community, and the hardships on the wolf itself, if you think about you know, lethal management and all that. And as wolves dispersed into new states and populations grew, the same challenges followed them. And today, wolves carry a huge burden on their back. I mean, they're a political instrument, a tool used for fundraising, they are the urban symbol of wilderness, <laughs> they're the scapegoat for rural communities, you know, uh, woes, all just for being a wolf and doing what nature intended. Living in a pack unit, hunting, having their pups, doing what they do. They have no idea. They're the most loved <laughs> and they are the most, um, you know, um, challenged of all the animals in history. And it really is, it's an interesting thing to look back at all that, I'm not gonna get into that, but look at the history and, and why that is here. Um, and you know, we know they play an important ecological role and it's one of the reasons, besides our love for this animal, uh, that we're drawn to them. But if you think about history and you look back, they're literally in every story in every culture, either as the villain or the hero, um, more than any other animal in history. So it's kind of an interesting thing to look at. So the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone is considered one of the greatest conservation stories of our time, right? And of course, since then we've had others. And, and it should be. I mean, considering how wolves were so capable of dispersing to new states, their ability to survive, and the huge accomplishment of those that worked so hard to make it happen. Same thing with the great uh, Mexican wolves, and now what you are hopefully gonna be able to accomplish. But when you look back at it, and it should be celebrated as success, but when you look back at what's happened since, has it really been that successful when you consider the whole story? The conflict, lethal management, what that makes. The continuation that we have seen state to state. Wolves come into a new state, people are excited, <laughs> they're protected, <laughs> populations grow, they get into trouble, lethal management comes in, and then it starts all over again. And we see it happen every state. In Colorado, hoping we'd do it differently, not so much, <laughs> you know? So it's like, okay, um, what are we missing here, right? It's kind of like the Einstein's theory, right? Of our definition of insanity, you keep doing the same thing the same way over and over again, expecting a different uh, result. And now look at what's happening in states like Idaho. It's like we're back to the anti-predator campaigns. You know, what, what's happening here? You know, this divisiveness is, it's crazy. And it's still here. It was then, it is today. This is actually Colorado, where the North Pack wolves were, until they were killed off. You, you come into that county, welcome to Jackson County, nice happy sign. You go about 50 feet down the road and you see this. <laughs> you know, welcome, not welcome. You know, so not a whole lot has changed there, which is um, unfortunate. So I remember reading this passage, a uh, book that Hillary Anderson gave me, one of my mentors, a long time ago. And I'm just gonna kinda, you can read the whole thing. But the last part, really is what got me. 
Um, I felt anguish because this fight had all the hallmarks of a tragedy. Both sides and all of us in between seemed destined to lose what was most valued by everyone. The health and diversity of the West, wide open spaces and the wild animals that lived here, lost to urban development and misplaced values. And I thought, wow, that is really powerful. And this is in a ranching book. And I thought, you know what, why is that? We are missing something. What is it that we're missing that we're still having these same conversations today? And so I kind of made it my own <laughs> mission, so to speak, to try to dig deeper and, and discover the why. Why are we here? What are we missing? Why haven't we able yet to create that lasting environment for wolves, wolves, livestock, and people? What is it that we're missing here? So I'm gonna play this video here. And so it's not super loud on the speakers, so you have to listen. And the question here, it's a sound you've all heard before, is when you listen to the whole thing and some of the background noises, I'm just gonna ask some of you, what emotion and what do you think when you hear it, okay? I'm gonna stop it right before the end because I apologize, there is a word that <laughs> I should have edited out um, from when I was in the field, but I will stop it hopefully before it gets there. <laughs> it's very subtle, but I realized, I just realized looking at it that I'm like, oh shoot, I forgot what, I forgot what was on this video. So um, hopefully I can keep it going, okay. Oops, technical difficulties. Oops. Okay, so sorry that some of those sounds were just, I don't know how it was playing on the speaker. So when you hear that, how does it make you feel? Anybody? Good. Yeah. It's like music. It's like music. music. Nature's music. All right. So why? So why? Um, and this is good. This is exactly where I wanted to go. So you did hear the Calmu. Because I know nobody's watching the cow. And um, the wolves are probably off trying to get hunting elk or something. But um, the tragedy of the whole ranching system is that they don't take responsibility I was thinking about this with my grandchildren at first, where the shepherds were watching their flocks by night. Mm. And I said, you know, that's what people used to do. Right. And now they don't do it, and they want a sterilized all of the world. Yeah. So did it make you afraid for those wolves? Yes. Mm -hmm. So some of the emotion you felt was... Right, the people are great. Well, it was me, so just so you know. <laughs> and it was after I actually hand, hand on foot escorted eight wolves out of the cattle. Um, they went over. Um, they weren't. I didn't expect them to be back. They were in the in the cattle. The horse wasn't ready, so I went in and shoot them out. And they went not that far and sat down. And so at the end of the season, I felt like they were mocking me. They weren't, of course. I was just loopy at that point. But the reason why I played that is because um, when people hear howling, and then you add the cow mowing in it, it does evoke different emotion. For you, it was like nature's music. For you, you're worried about the wolves, right? And what that means, who was there, who was recording it? What are those other sounds? It was just me out of breath, <laughs> chasing them out. Any other thoughts on that when you heard it initially? I think it's wild. Wild, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree, absolutely. So in this room, that's, gonna, that's what you would expect, right, for most of us? But for a rancher, that sound evokes fear. Fear of losing their livelihood, fear of losing their animals, fear of what the future is to bring, um, fear of what they don't know. And, and that's what has led to a lot of the unfortunate acts, you know, actions that have taken. So we'll come back to that in a little bit. So. If we're gonna look at the future of wolves, it is important to realize that in today's world, things are very different. Rather you're a rancher, that we have to realize that, or as a wolf advocate. It's, the landscape isn't the same as it was 150 or even 20 years ago. And this is a reality that we all must recognize. 
um, as, again, wildlife advocates or as ranchers. Because as human populations increase and competition for open space increases and the competition or the need for these contiguous open spaces, rather it's public or private, increases and those shrink, <laughs> um, co-occurrence between wolves and livestock is going to become more and more common. And for this reason, what ranchers provide in providing these open spaces is important. When my experience working out there, most of the packs that I worked with that were thriving and doing well was on private lands. So this man-created boundary between wild and working, where we try to separate everything, is not sustainable in today's world because of this co-occurrence. It's not, ranchers can never go back to 100 years ago and we can't completely expect everything to be rewild if we want this to work. We have to recognize that the two are now together and remove that and from the middle because that and is a battleground with no winners, absolutely no winners. So again, looking forward instead of backwards is really important part of this. And so one of the things you know to think about is looking at maybe changing the paradigm for how we define success when we look at wolf recovery. We are, you know, at least I always have been, and most people are in the, in the wolf world, we're focused on the wolves. The wolves, the wolves, the wolves. Ranchers are over here focused on, you know, the ranching, 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 ranching. And, and then so we just sometimes leave the people part out. And by doing that, we're finding that we're still in this struggle against each other, the push-pull thing. And it's kind of like a three-legged stool. One is actually quite dependent on the other. Um, wolves, livestock, and people. You take one out of the, or you focus less on one side, you're not going to be able to stay strong. You're missing that leg. So when ranchers fight against, you know, this conserva you know, the growth of the conservation mindset and the fact that wolves are here and going to be here, they're not helping themselves, you know, remain ranching on the landscape, right? It's just adding to the, to the fuel. When we are just focused on wolves and thinking ranching doesn't matter, you know, they need to deal with it, we're not helping support wolves staying on the landscape. So it is really important to consider all three in the picture and look at wolf recovery comprehensively and ensure that all three, wolves, livestock, and people are successful. Because if all, all three are successful, wolves are gonna be successful. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So kind of changing the paradigm of how success is defined and approached in our work, at least on the coexistence side. <laughs> um, so anyway, so what does this look like? Oh, can we uh, whoosh, shrink it? Shrink it. I mean, it's not that big deal. I mean, most of the slides, it won't matter, I don't think. Oh, you know what? Maybe that was my fault. No. Nope. I have no idea. Hmm. Actually, well, most of the slides, it won't matter. I don't want to break it. Yeah, we'll leave it. It's <laughs> OK. So looking at coexistence through a different lens to make it work long term is kind of what I want to focus on today. Um, because it is important that we look at it differently. Because as we talked about, how we've done it before hasn't necessarily worked that well. We're making progress, but we definitely have been missing something. And what I've found from my experience is the science and the polls and the short-term research don't often reflect the realities on the ground. And again, can't keep doing it the way it's always been done. And for us to move forward, we need to consider what's happening on the ground where wolves are gonna live, in the context where they live. And so that's how we started to moving into this direction. So basically, the idea is to manage less for wolves <laughs> and manage more to meet the needs of the ranch so that wolves can survive. Because more often than not, when uh, we approach coexistence, we are laser focused on the conflict. You know, the fact that there's conflict, laser focused on the wolves. And we're managing for conflict and managing the wolves, <laughs> wild wolves. And everything else gets kind of lost. And what this has happened is it's led to this continued outpouring of resources, one-way outpouring, money towards tools, money towards um, compensation, money towards lethal management. And as wolf populations increase and, um, you know, human populations increase, it's not sustainable. And we're not actually solving the problem of what's going on. And so this one way of outpouring 
is making it harder for wolf advocates, NGOs, and wildlife agencies. And, and it, we just can't keep going down this road. So the traditional use of tools like flagery, most of you know what flagery is, right? Um, people say, well, you know, just put flagery up. That's a lot of work to put that up. <laughs> a lot of work to maintain it, and it's expensive thousands of thousands of dollars and it's great for like calving pastures and controlled settings doesn't work out on the open range um, fox lights great for sheep and goats cattle will just mow them over <laughs> um, staying up all night trust me i've done it <laughs> you can only do it for so long right and range riding you can't be out there range riding is also a tool you can't be out there 24 7 and human presence will figure out when you're there and when you're not there Again, so the tools um, to deter wolves, again, we're trying to control wolves, deter the wolves, <laughs> um, or reactive measures like compensation and lethal, drain resources, don't actually solve the problem, and try deterring wolves over thousands of acres. It really doesn't work. Um, and also, it doesn't just drain financial resources, but it drains resources for the ranchers in terms of energy and emotionally. They don't have time to do this. And, you know, they don't like to be relying on outside people coming into their homes, literally, to do this kind of work. So, and also, if ranchers need to make all these changes and do all these things that cost money and take time and energy, even if it's paid for, um, it just makes them more resentful to the wolf because they're having to do all this change for the wolf, <laughs> you know. And so it's hard because they're dealing with a lot of other challenges in their, wor in their world. So what we're saying is that we need to consider investing less on physical tools, which have a place, they do have a place, you know, but investing less on physical tools that act as good short-term band-aids, but don't actually heal the problem or solve the problem. Invest more on comprehensive approaches that actually solve the problem. And that is where we come back to focusing on actually um, the ranch. There we go. So. <laughs> um, and that way, um, by managing less for wolves and more what's in the interest of the rancher, you're putting the control back into the rancher's hand and you're saving the resources for more important things in wolf recovery and you can actually focus on solving the problem. Um, so let's just go. Oh, there it goes. Sorry, I was wondering why it didn't go. So for this to work long time, long term, the investment in time, energy, and money has to be at least equal, give you an equal or greater return on investment for it to work. So what in the world what did everything I just say actually mean, right? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a lot, right? And so the idea is instead of controlling wild wolves, we're putting the control back into something the ranchers can control and letting them manage it by focusing on the ranch operations and managing the ranch and focusing on what actually is causing wolf livestock conflict to happen in the first part. Because again, deterring wolves over thousands of acres, really hard to do. Controlling wild wolves, really hard to do. <laughs> so let's put it back in to where ranchers can actually have control over what they're doing. And this, what this does is create um, a win-win scenario. So the key is to prevent loss while adding value to the rancher. So apart from emergency response <laughs> measures, focusing on the process of discovering first, why did the conflict happen? And carefully evaluating all the, the factors behind why the conflict happens will save a lot of time and resources. There's a tendency when there's conflict for everybody to run out. Let's just put up flagery. Let's just do this. We're going to provide rangers. We're going to do this. And nobody actually has taken the time to look at why the wolves took down those cattle. And we're gonna talk about vulnerability and how to address that. Because when you're looking at, if you look at where conflict has occurred, it's generally one or two ranches that get hit over and over again, like lose cattle. And their neighbors don't. What is happening on those ranches that are experiencing conflict that these other ranches are doing differently? There's something happening for those wolves to focus on those particular ranches. It's usually not a blanket thing. Go into a community, it's not just you know a calf here, a cow here, a calf here. It's usually the same ranches. So there's something happening there. Okay, so what does this actually look like? Well, first of all, you need to understand what's happening. So understanding is the first step. 
focus on the process of discovery before selling or implementing the solution. Again, we're so quick to just say, put out a range rider, put up Fladry, when we don't even know what's causing the problem. And again, none of these things solve that problem. <laughs> um, so what we do is we just spend time with the ranchers, spend time, get to know them, get to know their operations, who they are, what are their other challenges? I mean, you have to consider all the other challenges they're dealing with. You know, it's not just wool, sometimes it's water, sometimes it's, you know, the grass. Who knows what the pressures are that they're under? And the adding the wolf to it uh, can complicate things a lot more. And oftentimes we hear ranchers say, well, the wolves are just the last straw. And if that's the case, there's probably a lot of other things happening within that ranch. And so through this conversation, a lot of times when we talk through everything, and then some of the things we'll ask them is, if you were to lose a, you know, an animal, what does that mean to your ranch? How big of an impact is that? And how big of an impact is that compared to the other challenge you have? You know, and so get diving deep and looking at their operations as well as their vulnerabilities on the ground, a lot of times the ranchers will go, huh, you know what, wolves really aren't such a big deal. I've got bigger problems. And they're done. Others will go, you know what, it's worth building into my business plan, you know, some of the strategies that we'll talk about that could help mitigate the potential. Others are interested in, in just implementing them because they benefit the ranch in other ways. So understanding the ranches and then understanding the landscape. We spend a lot of time out there exploring, seeing how the cattle are using the landscape, looking at maps, making sure to avoid private property <laughs> because that does not go over well. <laughs> um, and because you can't create a coexistence plan if you don't understand what's happening on the land first, because that can be a factor. And also understanding the other critters out there. You know, what are they doing? How are they using the landscape? They also tell an important part of the story. The favorite part of my job is doing, you know, this, you know, doing the wolf tracking if we got wolves there, figuring out how the wolves are using the landscape. Um, because packs will kind of, they pick, you know, they, they figure out a pattern that they follow for hunting, you know, go to this pond every few days, go here every few days, and they kind of have this cycle. And if we can figure out how they're using the landscape, that really helps, again, inform what it is we're going to do. This is, don't worry, it wasn't during pupping season. <laughs> the old, old wolf den. <laughs> um, and, you know, using trail cameras, tracking, you know, old kills, um, and then keeping track of all that data is really, really helpful. And then we can work with the rancher to co-develop a plan based on their ranch operations, not controlling wolves or deterring wolves, to help reduce conflict risk. And this is um, an example of how that's done. So this will all start to make sense now, hopefully. <laughs> so understanding vulnerability. So an example of adding value to the ranch and supporting them and their resiliency while reducing conflict, along with managing less for wolves and for more what's in their control, all goes back to the concept of vulnerability. So I know you guys understand wolves, but just a quick review here. <laughs> a highly influential factor determining wolf hunting success is prey vulnerability, and this goes for livestock. We know that as wolves circulate, you know, on the landscape, if they come across potential prey, they're testing them. You know, they just, they poke at them, see what kind of a reaction, check for vulnerability. Can they get something to run? Is it vulnerable? Can they get a herd to run? They're always testing prey as they're moving along. Most of the time, they don't pursue it. Sometimes they might start and then back off. It's not worth it, but they're testing prey. They're not choosing cattle over elk or elk over cattle. You know, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. So they're testing prey, okay? And that's what they do. So, <laughs> Um, when they're hunting, <laughs> you know, so this is some pictures actually out of Yellowstone, um, you know, is a great example of elk, it's their nature to run, to run. When, when, they're, when, they, when the wolves add, put pressure on them, they take off. And that's how wolves decide what's vulnerable, who's to go after. Because wolves actually weren't designed very well to hunt unless they hunt in packs. They're not like mountain lion and ambush predators or bears where they can take down an animal quickly. Wolves need to, they want to come up from behind, right? Because they don't want to get clobbered by antlers and, and hooves and they could often do get injured and they can get killed. So they want to get behind the animal, try to hamstring it or weaken it so they can then bring it down, right? So if an animal turns and faces them or come together like bison, there's a very different thing that's happening here, right? <laughs> so that is an important thing to remember. Um, <laughs> 
So by understanding how wolves hunt, you can reduce, work to reduce vulnerability in cattle because the magic thing about cattle is they're actually a lot more like bison than elk, but they have lost that knowledge over time through domestication and the lack of predators on the landscape. So basically, if you're gonna raise prey in predator country, you wanna make sure your cattle is the least vulnerable on the landscape. But how in the world do you do that? <laughs> well, there's many factors that lead uh, to vulnerability in livestock. One of them is simple human handling of livestock. There's a direct correlation with how humans handle their cattle to how cattle respond to predator pressure because cattle will look at humans as predators. So the traditional Yahoo, push, push, push the cattle, hot shots, you know, coming up with their horses, cutting horses, all that, stresses cattle out. They look at us as predators, they run, they wanna get away from us, right? They don't understand what we're asking, they're afraid, they're stressed, okay? And so when a wolf comes along, adds pressure, they're like, ah, I gotta get away from the pressure. They wanna be away from pressure. So what do they do? They run, that's what wolves want them to do. So that's one of the things. Um, a terrain topography, you know, bogs, creeks, steep hills, these can all add a lot of downfall to vulnerability in cattle and hunting success for wolves. Mothering instincts of cattle, are they good mothers or not? <laughs> Single alone animals versus gathered herds. Um, encounter rate between natural prey and livestock or how many times wolves are near livestock can be a factor, of course. Um, fencing, just all kind of health of the animals, all kinds of things that can lead to vulnerability. And so by understanding this, you know, one of the things we do is we do these risk assessments is we evaluate all this. Where are the vulnerabilities on this ranch? Okay, now if a ranch has had conflict already, there is always a reason why that that ranch had conflict, always. And figuring out the why, then you can look to address what happened. Was it a herd health thing? Was it a fencing issue? Is it the way the cattle are handled? That's the usual thing. <laughs> um, you know, what is happening? And then how do you address those vulnerabilities? So that is one of the big things that we do. And one of the ways we do it is through um, stockmanship. We'll talk about that. So understanding vulnerability will help in evaluating wolf laws to conflict. And there can be any combination of factors. It's not always just one thing. And by understanding vulnerability, ranchers, wildlife agencies, and us <laughs> can make meaningful and proactive decisions in terms of coexistence strategies. So when a conflict does occur, there is always a reason or a combination of factors that uh, incident. And understanding these can help prevent the potential of further events. And then recognizing the above allows for understanding of chronic depredation versus vulnerability. So what we mean by that is you often hear, well, those wolves were chronic depredators. Most of the time, it's a vulnerability issue. You know, so uh, it just kills me. You, you hear of like lethal take orders, right? Because these are chronic depredators. Bet you most of the time it's a vulnerable, vulnerability issue that could be addressed and the depredation would stop. But nobody is dug deep enough to understand why that ranch is experiencing loss, because there's a reason. So what happens though, if, it, if a ranch is getting hit over and over again, and it's not handled, then it can become habitual to, with wolves. And they will start thinking of cattle as prey versus just the most vulnerable animal on that place and time. They keep associating successful hunts in a certain area, then they learn and then they can take that knowledge or that experience and actually apply it to other ranches that are doing everything right. So then it becomes a real issue. So trying to get to it soon and get buy-in soon is really, really important <laughs> um, and be proactive in terms of, uh, of this. Um, so tying it all together, how do, how do we then deal with it? Like we, we decide that, you know, okay, the cattle are vulnerable and we've you know, looked at the fencing and we've looked at these other factors, the cattle are healthy, um, how can we lose vulnerability? So this is an example, again, of adding value to the ranch in a sustainable manner um, and reducing risk. And one of the ways that we do this is through uh, Bud Williams' low stress livestock handling, and some of you may have heard of that. The problem with low stress livestock handling is that's a term that's been tossed around 
it's been kind of bastardized. People pick and use parts of it and don't you know, understand the principles behind it or they don't use it right. <laughs> and it's really an art form. And really what it is, is communicating to the cattle in a way that they understand, handling them in a way that they understand. Um, through, it's almost like natural horsemanship kind of thing, through pressure release, because just like every other animal, there's, they have a way of communicating. And if you're communicating to them like a predator, they're gonna respond like prey. But if you communicate to them in a way that's not threatening, by where, how you uh, position your horse, pressure release, understanding where their blind spots are, understanding what a predator acts like versus, you know, then um, they, they calm down and they learn to trust you. And it's really neat because one person <laughs> can then move a whole herd of cattle just by how they position their horse and pressure and release with a few of the animals, because they're herd animals and they'll follow each other. Where it used to take five, 10 ranchers hooting and hauling and chasing their horses around. So it's very efficient for ranchers. And then the other thing that's really cool about this is that um, because the cattle are not so stressed, <laughs> they actually have lower cortisol levels. And so the meat quality is better. Higher weight gains, higher conception rates, higher birthing rates. So it benefits ranchers regardless of the wolf. And this is what helps create that early buy-in. But it is important to understand the principles of it because they, people all the time are like, we're gonna do low stress livestock handling, but they're not understanding what it really means or how to do it and they haven't had all the training. And it backfires and ranchers say, oh, that's just hogwash. So you might hear that. I bring that up because you might hear that if you, you, you mention it. But it's not. It works, and it's, it's amazing, and it's super fun to do. And it's great for conservation work, too, especially in areas where you can't have fencing, like in forest service lands and some of these areas, because cattle seek comfort. They want to go. They always want to be the last place they felt safe. So what happens is ranchers are, you know, we might move cattle, you know, yaha, we want to get them out of the riparian and put them up on a hillside. Well, the cattle want to be where the good grass is, you know, by the water, but we don't want them there, you know, for conservation reasons, other reasons. So they push the cattle, you know, and push, 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 and put them up on the hill, and then they leave, and what do the cattle do? Run right back down to the good grass. But if their experience from moving from point A to B is positive, make, basically you're making your idea their idea, you can move them up there, leave them, and they'll stay. It's really amazing. So it works, it's, it's so neat in so many ways. It's so it's efficient for the ranchers, it's economically a better deal for the ranches, and once they realize it and learn it, they love it. So here's, I'm gonna just show you this uh, video here of, of trail camera, this is in California. And uh, see what happens. It's pretty short because it's just a trail camera clip, um, but you get the idea. So here's some cows. Here come some wolves. Wolves are like, eh, cows. Cows are like wolves. This one's not even putting his head up. Nobody's bothered. Cattle aren't running away. The wolves are like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Those are not worth my energy because they're not going to run. This one kind of stops and looks like, you know, those, those cows are supposed to be running or doing something. And they just kind of stare at each other. Um, so through low stress livestock handling, not only are you building confidence in the cattle, but then you can take it the next step. You can rekindle the herd instinct and get them to behave like this, like bison. Because it's there, they've just lost it. So if they trust you and you're handling them right, you start teaching them that when they see you coming or when you put pressure, they will start to come together on their own. They have time to respond to you versus react to you. So what if you have a cow-calf pair, instead of mama's panicking and running off and leaving her baby bedded down for the wolves to come, if it's you know, a wolf situation, our ranchers constantly chasing the moms to pick up their cattle, you, you approach them, the mom's like, oh, here comes, you know, we're gonna have to move somewhere. Where's my baby? Pick up the baby. They gather their baby and they start to come together and they get ready to move on their own. And that's called rekindling the herd instinct. They, they relearn that the herd is a safe place to be. And they relearn that they can handle themselves with wolves and other predators on the landscape. And they will do this with or without you. And I've seen it over and over again. And I was sharing the story earlier that even this last summer, we had a bunch of yearlings that we worked with with, with this. 
and they decided to put all the yearlings in the north pasture and I thought great that's exactly where the wolves go by every night you know let's see what happens so I went up on the hill I had the horse ready but I, you know I tried to leave the wolves alone <laughs> and the cattle were in the pasture sure enough the wolves came down they went oh, oh there's something new here I mean it was the same cattle they you know were trying to bother over here but they didn't realize because they had moved so they came down and they just started darting in and out really trying nipping at their you know their hind end getting them to try to get them to run and and those yearlings were like what are you doing what are you doing you know and one yearling kind of just kind of charged at the wolf and the wolves are like okay they're not they're not doing anything so they left next night they came back started pressuring the yearlings again and the yearlings were like really the wolves said well it's not worth it they left the next night, the wolves just came by, looked over, not worth my energy, right? It's a lot of energy to hunt. Kept going, you know? So it, it works. I've seen it myself. There's plenty of published papers that also show that it works. This is what you want them to do. Either if they're, if they're not in a group, and a lot of times ranchers will say, well, I can't keep my herd in tight groups. You know, I have to have them spread out. It's not what we mean by gathered groups. It just means that they'll kind of come together when they feel the pressure, um, and at the very least, just not react. They don't react. You know, wolves are very risk adverse. They're not like ambush predators or even coyotes. You know, some of the stuff doesn't work with coyotes because um, wolves are always weighing risk against vulnerability. You know, risk against vulnerability. Is it worth it? Is it worth getting injured? Is that prey vulnerable enough that I can have a successful hunt without dying? You know, so they're always weighing. That's why flagery works because it's a scary thing. I'm not, it's not worth for them in their mind the risk to cross through that scary thing to get that animal. Whereas coyotes, a little different, they just go right through it. Flattery, they don't care for the most part. Um, so wolves, in a lot of ways, are the easiest of the predators <laughs> to manage on the landscape. So that's just a bit of an example. So again, herd management in terms of specific stockmanship um, increased cattle's tolerance to predator pressure while reinforcing, reinforcing the herd instinct and shown to be, well, I would say very more than effective in boosting the cattle's natural defense, thus reducing conflict. Um, we already talked about, you know, cattle handled translates to how they were handled uh, by people, how they handle predator pressure. And this is something that's directly in the control of the ranchers. They're out there working their cattle, and they don't have to do this every day. You have to spend a good intensive few weeks when you get new head in and work with them. But after that, just, you know, every few days or so, reinforcing it or checking on them. So they don't have to be out there every day, you know. <laughs> that's the beauty of it. Um, so it's sustainable, it's in the control of the ranchers versus trying to control wild wolves. You're addressing the vulnerability, right? And getting to the root of what's causing the conflict. If it's a health issue, low stress livestock handling is great because you can go right up to the cattle, you can treat them, it makes it easier, you know, because they trust you to treat vulnerabilities. Um, I mean, there's just, you can just go on and on on the benefits of this. So instead of deterring, wild wolves or trying to control wolves, you're focusing on the cattle. And these things do have the co-benefits in terms of operational efficiency and economy. So you're reducing loss while adding value to the ranch. You're making that ranch stronger. And if a rancher feels that wolves aren't such a threat or if the ranch is actually stronger because of these, like they're better off financially or efficacy or whatever it is, then they have the resilience to withstand the lo uh, loss of one or two. And they're not so emotional about it either because it's not the end of the world. One of the things we do is we will sponsor um, ranchers to ranching for profit school. <laughs> and people often say, well, what does that have to do with wolves? Well, again, if the ranch is strong and resilient business-wise and they can build in this stuff into their business plan like anything else, wolves become less of an issue in their minds and in economy and they love this stuff so to me this is a good investment versus the tools is that starting to make sense now like what i was saying to begin with i know it was a lot at first <laughs> so basically the working foundation merging ranchers knowledge of their land and livestock and grazing experience they're the ones that know the land better than anybody else with cutting head herd management strategies with the science of wolf biology and behavior understanding how wolves use the landscape Take that with rancher's knowledge, and boom, it's a great thing. So the key here is getting to the root of the why. Why is the conflict happening? And addressing those vulnerabilities. And it works. But we have historically 
done it the other way around. We focus on controlling wolves, deterring wolves, deterrence, deterring, you know, it doesn't work. Um, where if you look at it from kind of the backdoor approach, the ranching side, putting it back in their control to reduce and address why conflict might happen, you avoid the problem from begin with and there's nothing to band-aid. Does that make sense? All right, so anyways, <laughs> I love these quotes from one of the ranchers we work with, you know, cattle being cattle and wolves being wolves, conflict will always be a factor, so there's no perfect answer. But the trick is making this work is how we handle it as people, right? That's a big part of it. Um, both the wolf folks and the cattle folks alike. And another quote from the same gentleman, success long-term and sustainable coexistence is not easy, but surely it's possible for willing to get beyond our pride and just be smart about it. Because one, one of the challenges we've had is convincing wolf advocacy groups that, yeah, supporting ranches, you know, rather, no matter what you feel about public grazing is the way to go. Meaning, focus on what you want versus fighting against what you don't want or fear. So a little analogy here from one of the ranchers we work with. Uh, she was talking about that they've been fighting these um, invasive weeds, you know, toxic weeds to the cattle. And they had every expert come in fighting the weeds, fighting the weeds, using herbicides, you know, everything they could think of to fight the weeds. And nothing was working. They finally brought in another expert. And he's like, man, you have spent a lot of money and time and energy fighting these weeds. And she's like, yeah, we really have. And I, we, we just, it was a losing battle. And he said, what have you done? What resource have you put into growing what you want to grow? Like, what have you fed the soil <laughs> to grow the, the grasses you want? And it's a powerful analogy. So again, with ranches, what do they want? They want to stay on the landscape. They want to keep ranching. What do we want? We want wolves on the landscape, right? <laughs> we can get there together um, through these practices. It's that win-win scenario, right? Um, we get our wolves. Ranchers keep ranching, reducing the conflict. They're stronger because of the wolf. That open space provides habitat for the wolf, and the agencies have less conflict to deal with. And we're seeing that. Like now in Colorado, that is trending in the right direction. CPW was, Colorado Parks was so skeptical about what we were doing out there until they came out and saw it for themselves. Now he's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, this is what we need to do. Um, so again, it's just being um, really smart about it. And so that's one of the reasons I really, really like this quote. So, but not everybody can be out in the field, right, and do what we do. And so advocacy itself is also an insanely powerful tool for coexistence to work. Because one of the challenges we have in even getting to be able to talk to folks is how we handle advocacy on this side. Advocacy is one of the most powerful tools we have that everybody here has. And how you approach advocacy can actually forward wolf recovery and coexistence on the ground, whether you never step a foot in the field, <laughs> or it can actually hinder that momentum. And we've had a lot of wonderful folks with good intentions set some of the efforts backwards. And part of it has to do with being cause-driven and the power of the whole story. So I want to talk about this a little bit because this is something that everybody in this room has the power to do <laughs> and be transformative in their work for wolf recovery. So I really love this quote. Um, and it goes on, though, to talk about the incredible but harmful power the single story holds when told over and over again. And when you stick to the assumptions or stories others have told you, you miss out on maybe what the real story is. And that story is often the story we all need to hear. When I started this work, you know, and I'm still a hardcore wolf advocate, you know, I used to go to the rallies and I was like, we gotta get rid of ranching and you know, just down this thing. <laughs> I had no idea that what I was doing was actually hurting wolves on the ground, leading to potential for, for poaching because of the things I was saying and doing. I didn't know the whole story. I had the half story. I had the story that I was told by like-minded people, by organizations that I trusted and looked up to, you know, that were my heroes because of all the great work they did. The story that I was being told was the story that I held on to and I was passing it on. But just like there's a balance in nature, there has to be a balance in how we work with others. And by sticking to a single story and not taking the time to learn the whole story and how we go about advocacy work, these, this creates a barrier of assumptions that actually inhibit our ability to move forward in a meaningful way. 
and I've seen it over and over again. So for example, blanket statements such as all ranchers are wolf killers, <laughs> or all grazing on public land is bad, or, or ranchers, on the other hand, will often say, you know, wolf advocates are hypocrites, you know, because they just, you know, they live in these urban areas and cement everything, um, or they're out to destroy our way of life. Is, is what we're saying helping wolves, really? No, it's not. You're just fueling the flames and making them angry. And it's not the real story. I mean, that was the story I used to tell <laughs> until I learned different. I actually learned that, wow, these ranchers care about their animals deeply. They care about the land. They're proud of their culture and their heritage. And they don't actually hate wolves. Most of them will tell you, I don't really hate wolves. They make me nervous. I don't want to meet my cattle. But it's what the wolf represents. It represents the people that they feel are trying to destroy their way of life and everything that they stand for. And let me tell you, their way of life is pretty darn awesome because I've had the chance to live it. And they're good people and they care deeply. And so make sure you know the whole story. It's really, really, really important. And it, you know, as I said, in my early experience, you know, I had that same single story. Very linear in my approach. <laughs> and everything I did about wolves was for my agenda. Even my outreach to ranchers was for my agenda to save wolves. I didn't really care about them. And it did have my um, world kind of turned upside down when I was invited to some of these ranches that opened up their hearts and homes to me. And I realized that they were actually really amazing people, you know? And, but it goes both ways. Um, a couple years ago or so, I was out in the field and I came across um, a ranching couple and they're asking what I was doing and they're like, are you one of those wolf people? And I just kind of stood back. I almost wanted to say, no, not me, you know? It was like I was embarrassed to be a wolf person. And I, I didn't know how to answer. I felt guilty because I was a wolf person out here in ranching country. But I realized that their reaction towards me was based on their single story of me, right? So it does go both ways. So to move forward, we have to lower these barriers of assumptions. And just as they learned, that all wolf advocates, you know, aren't out to get them. <laughs> we have to recognize that ranchers really care about wildlife and the land and take a lot of pride into it. And we can't allow us to go get into that, you know, we have to send me all your money, you know, otherwise ranchers are going to kill all the wolves, right? We got to avoid these kind of scenarios. Um, and it really is important to take the time to learn the whole story and be what I call cause driven. So basically, thinking about the actions we take and including the things that we say in, in everything that we do. There's that old rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But they do hurt, and they hurt wolves. Those killings of the packs in um, Colorado, the ranchers flat out admitted they were revenge killings, you know? Um, I'm not saying that there's, they have an excuse for it. And these were, you know, of course there's extremes on both sides. But what I'm saying is we need to be careful because when we're out there saying certain things, it's just, are you fueling the flames? Is it really helping wolves? Or are you actually hurting them inadvertently? Um, so again, be careful in what we say. Pay, pay attention to the words you say in your advocacy and make sure you know the whole story and think about the actions we have. Is it helping or is it hurting? Um, are we creating more real resentment towards wolves and resistance to working with us? Or are we actually helping things move forward? Same thing in the livestock community. I tell the ranchers, when you're out there pushing, putting lethal control out front, you know, like we want lethal control, we want lethal control, or you're shouting the SSS, is that really helping you stay on the landscape? You really think you're gonna get support, <laughs> you know, for grazing on public lands? You think people are gonna wanna buy the meat? No, you're not helping yourself stay on the landscape in the modern world, right? So again, focusing on what we want instead of fighting against what we fear or we don't want. Think about growing the right grasses. You know, because the wolf is neither saint nor sinner except by those who make him so. And this is really uh, super important because over glorifying the wolf or over demonizing doesn't serve any of our causes, right? So that's why I talk about being cause driven. Um, so again, understanding, taking the time to understand ranching, you know, a little bit, you know, this is a multi-generational ranch family, you know, grandparents, dad, kid, <laughs> and they were struggling and they were going to sell the ranch because they were having a hard time making ends meet. They were done. They were tired of fighting, tired of water issues, afraid that wolves were coming. And, um, 
we were working with them, helped them kind of change how they were using the landscape, grazing uh, the cattle, and they ended up having a lot of success. With wolves on the landscape, the health of the cattle improved, and lo and behold, um, the sage grouse settled in there and left on their property every year. They created, and they were just so proud of that. And I've seen that over and over again. You know, they say, did you know we have this rare modoc sucker fish here because of this work we did in our stream? But did you know that, you know, we've got these elk, you know, they're very proud of being, con they think of themselves as conservationists and they actually resent that we say we're the conservationists and they're the ranchers because they're like, how can that be? You live in the cement, you know, <laughs> communities. So again, um, just being aware that these are real people that we're talking about. And again, it's not about giving up our values. We're not saying we're not wolf advocates. We're not giving up our values and we don't want to. Um, it's just about understanding values and understanding that there are different people that might have you know, a different way of life than we do. Doesn't mean you know, that they don't care. Um, and again, we're not trying to change people's minds. It's about looking to change mindsets and meeting people where they are at. So, you know, moving beyond the myths, ranchers, can't make good management decisions based on myths surrounding the wolves, right? There's a lot of myths and those fears are real. They actually are really afraid. They actually think wolves are gonna eat their children, you know, because that's what they've been taught, you know? Um, and wolf advocates, you know, cannot um, make good advocacy decisions based on myths surrounding ranchers too. We need to know that whole story. I think it's very, very important. And I love this quote, we cannot do our best when we're fighting against our worst. So think about being cause-driven. Don't fight against our worst so that we can do our best for wolves in the landscapes that we care about so deeply. Take that risk, you know, reach out, get to know folks. If you have an opportunity, if you get invited to a ranch, go, but be prepared to stay all day long and make sure you follow up. Ranchers can't stand it when environmental say, I want to come meet you, and they're there for now, I want to leave, or they never hear from them again. It's very personal to them. They oftentimes, they don't care what organization you're with, but they care about the person. They want to know you. Why, why do you care about wolves personally? Don't give them the whole argument about wolves are you know, ecologically valuable. That's not what's important to them. Think about what's important to them. Speak to their values, share where you're at. But you know, like for example, when a rancher says, why do you care about wolves so much? Why wolves? My story is, well, because they are one of the only animals out there that take care of their sick, injured, and young, even when resources are low. You know, they, you know, they just, they're, they're family you know, or their pack unit, you know, the way they work together, it's just so inspiring to me. That's what they wanna hear, not how they're gonna save the world, right? So just some things. Um, you know, so reach across the aisle and build those relationships. It is so rewarding, you know? Some of these ranchers are such good friends. And then another thing to think about with what I presented in, in um, you know, our approach to coexistence is compromise. You know, we often talk about how, well, you gotta compromise, you gotta meet in the middle. And that doesn't work so well in this scenario. And the reason is, is that compromise immediately puts up barriers because that means giving up something of value. And that's hard, you know, and ranchers are very fearful of that. So like when we talked about our approach, you know, this win-win scenario where we're reducing conflict but helping build the ranch, nobody's giving anything up. Ranch is ranch, and they're actually better off for these things because of the wolf, and we get our wolves, right? So trying to find that, that way forward. Um, so again, if our mindset are different, then our activities will be different. I love this. Um, so this picture on the right was a bunch of some wolf advocates in um, Oakland, California. And they learned what some of these ranchers were doing on their ranch so that wolves could live on their ranch. And they, you know, thank you for protecting our wolves. Now, not that rancher Jessie, <laughs> we still work with, wants to be known as, you know, the rancher protecting wolves. But she was over the top touched by this that these folks put this together, you know? And this was a group of folks that were just really anti-rancher when we started working with them until they saw firsthand what they did. Wally, won't get that whole story, but he chased me out of town twice and, you know, <laughs> finally realized it wasn't the enemy and he's still a good friend today. So you just never know where this is gonna do. Um, so again, so much is about mindset. It really, really is. So do as bubbles do. What does the ocean have to do with any of this? Well, just something to think about because sometimes when we look at advocacy and all the issues with wolves, it can get really overwhelming. 
And I know folks are like, ah, it's too much. I can't, you know, just don't want to think about it anymore. Uh, you know, how can I really make a difference? How can one person really make a difference? Well, when I worked at the Ocean Institute way back when, we, did, we were working with the National Science Foundation, and we did this whole public programming on the power of bubbles in ocean waves and how the sound of crashing waves is actually the sound of billions and billions of bubbles bursting. And when they did that, they actually helped um, capture some of the carbon um, from the air, and waves actually help um, mitigate um, our atmosphere as well as um, uh, climate, believe it or not. So for example, with climate change, we're seeing more storms, right? And, it, and then we see a lot more of these hurricanes and rough waters and rough seas, and all that white water is nature's way of trying to combat what's happening. Of course, we've overwhelmed it now, but meaning one bubble isn't making a difference in our atmosphere, in our climate, or our weather. But the billions of bubbles crashing together around the world is what's helping and has a huge impact on the air that we breathe. So one bubble, one person may not think, oh, you're not you know, making a huge difference, but all of us together, thinking differently, taking different actions, can be absolutely transformative to the future of wolf recovery, if we're willing to go there. So just do as bubbles do. You're gonna stumble, you know, you're gonna make mistakes. It's okay, we all do, right? Don't be afraid, just go for it. And through this, it's heavy stuff, there's no doubt, right? You have to have humor along the way. And believe it or not, ranchers sometimes have humor too. They were selling this at the hardware store in North Park. <laughs> And for every uh, one they sold, they donated a dollar to whatever ranch was having conflict. So it was great. So um, you got to have some humor through all this. And again, this is a quote I just saw the other day. I love it. Nothing is predictable, but everything is possible. You know, wolf recovery can happen. We have, we know the why of behind why it hasn't worked. We finally have answered that. We have the recipe to make it work now. We didn't have it five, ten years ago. So everything is possible. And I never would have thought in a million years I'd be riding out on ranches and doing this as Wolf Advocate. Never. I mean, yeah, I rode horses, English, but, the, <laughs> um, but never did I thought I'd be spending my summers on these ranches um, and, and doing what I do. So you never know. So looking forward, we have the opportunity to get it right. We have the ability to create that lasting environment, each and every one of us. We have the ability to neutralize that polarizing debate that has hindered wolf recovery. And we can do it. I'm convinced of it. So in closing, just want to share this quote. You know, when we're trying to build these key relationships and build these bridges across, you know, diverse perspectives and, and all this controversy, um, you know, it's hard. And you have to create a safe place for people to come together. You have to build that trust. You have to create this field for people to come together and feel safe. And all of our actions can help do that. But even if you're successful in creating that field for people to come together and have these conversations, you can't expect everybody to just come running into the middle. Like you can't just say, okay, I've done all this stuff, now what? It's your turn. Sometimes you have to walk across that field and reach out your hand. Thank you. Oh, I almost did it, I almost shut it. Anyways, happy to take questions. Oh, I'll stand over here if I can, I'm like, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Never looked at the cattle cart before. Um, are there a lot of people like you that do what you do? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's you know it's interesting, which is why we're so I guess niche, niche, niche. How do you say? Uh, specific. Like we used to try to do everything. We were doing education, outreach, school programs, this, that, and the other. But as we started to hone in on the why, the why, because that was like my my thing. Why? Why haven't we figured this out? Why are we still here 20, 30 years later? Why? 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 Um, then in narrowing it down that now we just focus on that. So no, no, there's folks that talk about low stress, but they don't really understand it. Um, people talk about herd management, don't necessarily understand it. But as far as I know, no one is doing, uh, no wolf advocacy, I guess, group is doing what we do and putting all their focus on it. Um, it's, it's still fairly new, but what's neat is I'm hearing more about it out there now. Like you're starting to hear about it now at least. So maybe there's a seed that's growing, but nobody has, I don't think, the expertise like even the agencies are like, ah, this is too much. And we're like, we're not expecting you to teach this stuff, but if you understand the concept of how it works, 
that when you're talking about the tools, present this and then allow us or whoever to actually provide the training and the support to actually do this. So I have a habit of doing long answers to short questions. So as far as I know, no, not exactly what we're doing. <laughs> Um, um, uh, two, uh, one staff, <laughs> sorry, changed recently, one staff, and then um, three contractors, two con three contractors right now would be two, and, but because the idea is that we want the ranchers to do it. So we have an operations person, yes, operations person, we have our lead rancher contractor that, you know, kind of is their face. Um, and then a gal, Maddie, we just brought on as a contractor in Colorado to help with some of the stuff on the ground. Um, yeah, so we're trying to build capacity, but we keep focusing on the ground and not fundraising. So, so, <laughs> so. you have the ranchers themselves who are advocating yeah. for you? Yes, yes. So, so the idea is that we, you know, we won't just go provide range riding, except in the rare case that I was doing it. Um, the idea is they have to identify a family member or a community trusted member so they could do um, resource sharing. And then we will put them, or them, whoever it is, through the, the training, the clinics, give them the ongoing support, ranching for profit, send them to a stockmanship clinic or bring folks there. And then we'll you know, continue to work with them because it takes time. Um, so basically we start out, after we get the relationship, doing risk assessments to identify the vulnerabilities then work with whomever to create a plan, because it's not a one-shoe-fits-all scenario, and to address those vulnerabilities, and then stockmanship is always part of it. Cattle handling is always a big part of that. Um, but then they generally do it. The reason why I was doing it on this ranch was because in North Park, it's very seasonal, and the cattle come in for a certain part of the year, and then they're not, and the ranch hands were coming in seasonally, and they had jobs. And nobody was gonna work with the wolf advocacy group, you know? because of the reintroduction program, right? Even though we weren't part of it, they associate, you know, anybody that likes wolves were evil. Um, but this one ranch decided to take a risk on us. And I said, you know, I can't find anyone, I'm sorry. And he's like, well, you know it, you ride a horse, you do it. You know, show me. And so I, I did, I spent five and a half months at uh, summer before and then four months. And now that the family's good friends now. Um, so, but normally that's not the model. <laughs> we don't provide, you know, like a lot of models, they provide range riding. We don't bring in outside people. It has to be, they, ha they do it. We will, we will sometimes provide initial financial support to offset the cost of that until the economic benefits then catch up with it. That makes sense, yeah. Yes. Oh, from Zoom, or wait, okay. <laughs> Certainly. Um, Michelle asks, as you look forward, what benchmarks do you have in the next five years? Is it numbers of wolves or is it ranchers participating in working circle? I would say it is in um, ranchers adopting, it doesn't matter who does it, adopting these practices that um, not only benefit them but reduce conflict which then benefits um, the wolves. Because we're focused on the coexistence side of things, right? So. One of our donors once asked, how do you measure success? Who do they call first, you know? So if they're calling for help from a wolf group, that's usually pretty good. Um, so I would say it's how many ranchers are adopting these, it's not really a strategy, but practices and approaches. Better for the land, better for wildlife, better for wolves, and better for them. Yeah, and it's growing. It's definitely, we definitely have this huge, not just because of the reintroduction, but in other states, all of a sudden just this year, it's like, getting a lot uh, more states and a lot more folks interested um, in this, in our work. So it's exciting because it works. Yeah. The thing is it works. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. So a lot of states still have that. Defenders started that program, and it was insanely meaningful um, and important you know, when it was developed because we didn't have a lot of the tools and strategies that we do now. And it still has an important role, and a lot of states use it. The problem with compensation, and this is actually coming from one of our rancher partners, what I'm about to say, <laughs> is that um, it may have had a, a time and a place for full compensation, but now it's counterproductive, meaning What's happening is that it's actually inhibiting ranchers' ability, mindset, to move forward. 
and adopt these other practices, especially with multipliers, you know, when, when they lose one animal, maybe, and then they get compensated for five. Um, because if they're getting paid, sometimes they're not taking the time to learn these other things, and it, it continues this mindset of a victim. You owe me this. You know, these wolves are here, so yeah, you owe me this. Um, so we think it is a good if it was short term, meaning while they're they, practicing and implementing these stockmanship um, strategies and dressing vulnerabilities and building their ranch resiliency and strength, then that can help offset some of those costs, but it should be for a short amount of time, two, three years, um, and that's it. Um, not a, uh, it should not be a solution. It's a reactive approach. Lethal is reactive, conversation is reactive, and it doesn't, like California, I think one of the reasons it was so successful there is ranchers didn't have a choice. You know, lethal was not on the table, and conversation wasn't either until recently. Um, so it's not something we support long term. We think it's actually counterproductive long term for ranches not just for us, and it's not sustainable. I mean, there's gonna be more wolves. <laughs> it's not, that's, again, that's that outpouring of resources. All these things cost money. This is free. The stockmanship's free, and they save money, and it's more efficient. Benefits the ranch and wolves, and it's sustainable. And ranchers can, ranchers can have their independence. They don't like all the outside agencies, environmentalists coming in, you know, telling them what to do. This puts the power back. And they actually, those, like this ranch we're working with now, when the wolves first came in, the one in Colorado, rather, um, they were a wreck about it. And because they were denning and having pups right there. And then they started getting curious about it because they weren't having loss. They want to learn more about, you know, uh, wolves. Well, now when I'm out there, if I see the wolves, I know that I better text and let them know, not because they're panicking, because they want to come see the wolves. You know, they're excited about the wolves. You know, if I take that threat away, and uh, they care about their, that wildlife, and you know, and they're like, "Don't tell anybody," but I actually think wolves are really cool. We hear that a lot, so the compensation doesn't help. Yeah. Yes. I was really taken about your your approach of having cattle act like bison and defend themselves, and I was just wondering. This is probably a bit of a larger question, but not all cattle are the same. Correct. And the extreme longhorns have a lot of those behaviors. They never lost them. And they have all these big horns that actually are very effective at defending themselves. Yes. Are there some sorts of sort of cattle that are better at protecting themselves? Do ranchers even think about you know, stocking them? They certainly do. So some of the strategies is uh, mixing ages. You know, instead of just having yearlings, you know, for example, mixing different breeds. Certain breeds are flightier than others. Um, really a lot of it comes down to the cattle handling, like some of the earlings that we would get on this ranch had, were handled terribly before and they were just a wreck. The problem with the longhorns um, is that they injure each other and they have less market um, value because they bruise each other, <laughs> you know, and it affects the meat. Um, and so that's why they bred, you know, bred that out of most breeds. So like for example, the white park um, breed is great naturally. You don't have to teach them anything, and they just do it. They just take care of themselves, and they'll actually chase wolves. But their meat's terrible. Um, but there are so there is, and so that's something that can be bred in a little bit more naturally. Um, and you know, so for example, ranchers will do that to an extent. Like if there's a cow that uh, doesn't have good mothering instincts, they'll they'll cull that genetics out. You know, so they do look for genetics and work with that. Um, and, and so that, the herd management is just one of several things to reduce vulnerability. So I was just trying to give you one example, but you're absolutely right. There are breeds that are better, um, mixing them, ages, classes, all kinds of things. How you rotate them through different pastures at different times of the year, things like that. Fencing. Yes. Is this presentation? So I have ones, uh, well, I don't do the advocacy one to the ranchers, other than uh, letting them know that when they're saying SSS and talking about lethal control, they're not helping themselves. I do tell them that. Um, but um, it's a fairly newer presentation, to be honest, because, um, you know, kind of the approach we're taking these days. But I adjust it depending on the group, you know, depending on what they're focusing on, what they're doing, what they want to learn. I mean, we do have a full, like, you know, the wolf ecology, biology one. We have a whole depredation investigation. I didn't want to show those slides. They're not very 
pretty to look at. <laughs> um, you know, so, but this is one of them. This is actually two that I combined for tonight. Yes. So when cows reproduce, do you have to keep the calves? Well, the calves are shipped off to market generally. So they only keep a certain amount. Yeah, so, so in a cow-calf pair, the cows are kept as long as they're breeding um, and producing their calves. Um, the calves are kept for a season, and they're usually shipped off to market or to be finished grazed somewhere else as yearlings. Um, so, for example, some ranches are cow-calf operations. You work with the cows, you know, make, reinforcing the mothering instinct, all the things we talked about, um, and they protect those calves and then the cows are getting shipped off and, and they'll remember it the next year. You know, sometimes you have to tune them up a little bit the next year before they're turned out. So generally uh, the cows, the animals are brought closer to home um, or they're moved to a different location in the winter time. And so what we do or we, what we talk about is preparing them before they're turned out to, to you know, turned out for grazing, you know. Um, and because when they're turned out, you're not out there with them all the time. So you work with them close to home and then turn them out. Now, with like this ranch in Colorado, um, they bring in new groups of yearlings every year because they do finish grazing for other owners. So they have several different owners that send their cattle to this ranch to finish graze, grass-fed, right? And so we have to start over, but it takes about three weeks is all. Yeah, so like for example, in April, we're gonna start working, they're getting their shipment in early on purpose so we can work with them for a month before they get turned out. No, anywhere from, um, you know, 20 to 4,200. Yeah. And then we'll just like, so we'll work with this group of 2,500 and then the next day we might go over here and, you know, so we, you know, we visit different pastures, different yeah. days. Yeah, so, but the, the, the thing is, that's what's great about it is, you know, one person can move a whole, just by communicating with them in a certain, and they figure it out. You know, you're, you're talking their language, basically. It sounds silly, but basically what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, it isn't once after you've done the initial, uh, you know, couple of weeks, three weeks. That's the whole point is that you can then it's less intensive because it takes five to ten ranchers to move these cattle. And now they can do it with one and you don't have to be out there every day. That's the thing with like traditional range riding. Well, they say you have to be out there. It's human presence. You have to be out there every day. You got to be with your cattle all the time. This you don't have to. So. Yeah, for, for the, tra well, we try to get them to do it, <laughs> but the initial, so the, usually we work with them for one, two, maybe three years, the ranches, and then they, they don't need us anymore. That's the whole idea, is that, because we're only so many people, right? So like we, this one ranch that was on the last two years, I'm not, I don't have to go back, you know? One more, are you working yeah. at all in Arizona? Not right now. I mean, not that we don't want it, it's just capacity. And the only reason why we start working in Washington is because Washington State is funding the work up there. And they're going to pay for capacity building. So, yeah. Is it all uh, cattle management or do you help with other livestock species? Just cattle. It doesn't work on sheep. We've taken away their natural, natural defenses, all the rocks and cliff faces. But the thing is, herders, they're used to, though, the fencing. I mean, they're used to dealing with the fencing and using herding and all that. So. Um, in some ways, it's easier because it's already part of what they do. Do you, you know? But now instead of just regular fencing, it's flattery maybe. Um, but it's also tough because these things do not work on goats and sheep. So yes, cattle, cattle ranches is what we focus on. Oh yeah, it happens for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a lot more devastating because a wolf will take out an entire herd. You know, because they don't know where the next meal is coming from. So it's not, you know, people often talk about the surplus killing, you know, wolves kill for fun and they just go in there and they just take everything. It's a vulnerability issue, right? So like, you know, a couple summers ago, there were six elk and six uh, pronghorn that were killed in, in North Park in Colorado and the ranchers went nuts. You know, they just took all these down. Well, you tend to see surplus killing towards the end of the winter 
when, and, and harsh winters when the ungulates, you know, are struggling <laughs> health-wise, strength-wise, and usually it's in deep snow or a boggy area, it's a vulnerable, or there's fencing there, um, moles take advantage of vulnerability, and if there's, again, normally in nature, they would be, come back day after day to feed on that animal, right? Or another thing that's a way nature says, um, I think it was Doug Smith was talking about it, when they've seen this happen, is that it's kind of nature's way of helping the other predators in a tough winter. Wolves take it down, they eat what they need, they often will leave it, but then the bear and the fox and everything else, you know, has something to eat in these harsh winters. So it's not that they're just like, ooh, I want to kill everything. I know you guys know this, but that's one of those myths, right? That wolves are these vicious killers, they're just going to kill everything if they can. And then sheep in a pen or goats, let me talk about vulnerability, you know. Yeah, they do. Well, we don't, again, we, that's, it's, that's, we, we, well, we, we're just so focused on the cattle ranching. And there's a lot of folks, like Wood River Project, a lot of great projects that are focused on sheep and uh, sheep and goat, you know, um, because that is focused on the tools and the deterrence. You can't really remove that vulnerability unless you start putting them on hillsides, <laughs> cliff, cliff sides again. So we focus, yeah, yeah. So we are very niche focused. But. Yeah, and some ranches have given up sh uh, sheep because of wolves, but the thing is with the guardian dogs and these radioactivated, you know, guard boxes and uh, with Fladry and some of the, the deterrence, they're having a lot of success um, because, you know, with um, sheep and others. So there are ways to make it work uh, for sure. It's just not what we focus on. And I'm not an expert with it too, so I don't want to say things that I'm not, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, mountain lion and bear, and some of the stuff actually helps with that as well. Um, but you know, those are ambush predators, you know, so they kind of behave differently. Like I said, wolves are one of the easiest um, to manage, and that's the thing. Ranchers will be like, "Yeah, I lost, you know, five cows to you know mountain lion or bear last year." You know, they lose one animal to a wolf. And again, it's just this psychological thing. It's the end of the world, right? So the wolf is like this scapegoat for everything. You know, when you look at domestic dogs cause more cattle loss than wolves, <laughs> by far. <laughs> and of course, there's pneumonia and disease and weeds and everything else. Wolves are way down the list. So it's really more about what the wolf represents and the fear, you know, um, behind them and a lack of understanding. So obviously, when we're working with ranches, you know, we don't tell them they're wrong. But, you know, we try to empathize, you know, I'm so sorry that you feel this way. We understand why you believe this. You know, this is just something we've heard over and over again. But, you know, let me share with you, you know, from my experience, what I've seen, you know. And when they hear that I actually will go camp next to wolves, they're just like, really? You know, um, you know, again, this the real fears, you know, they're not being nuts. This is what they've been taught. And it's their their single story because that's all they know and what they've been taught for generations. And they were taught their grandfather's freed ranching by getting rid of predators. Um, but they're open to having a mindset change. Yes. Yeah, we, we stay in contact with all of our ranchers. I mean, even the ones in California that we haven't had to support in 10 years plus, you know, we, they're friends. You know, we talk to them and reach. I mean, sometimes we'll send up trail cameras, you know, because they like to monitor the landscape and see what's going on. Um, but we still go up and visit every year, you know. Um, so absolutely, we stay in contact. Um, I can't think of one original rancher that we don't stay in contact today. Because that's another part of it, you know, connecting people to people, right? We're always going to be there a phone call away. They know they can talk to one of our rancher consultants, and we try to get them to talk to each other. You know, I had this scenario on my ranch, and what do you think? Oh, yeah, I had this happen. What do you think? And they're sharing ideas. They're looking for new creative ways to approach this. Can I do that activity real quick? Okay, so I want to show you guys something really fun. If you have seen this before, don't answer, okay? Otherwise, it'll run for everybody. So, one thing that's really great about this whole process, I'm going to use the blue pen because it's fatter. Hopefully, you can see this. Okay, I have terrible writing, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we'll just do D. Okay, can you see this? Okay. So there are letters up here on this board. And again, if you've done this act activity, 
don't, don't say anything, please. So if you look at these letters on the board, which one of them looks different than the others in your mind, and why? C? How many people think it's C? Any other thoughts? Any other letters? Why C? Oh, it's open. Okay, good. Anything cap. else? Oh, it's cap. That's true, because of my writing. Um, <laughs> what about the T? <laughs> so here it is, and it's a T if you look at it. It's the biggest letter up here, right there, right under your nose. So we use this analogy when we're looking for solutions, right? Getting creative, thinking out of the box. Sometimes the solution is right there. It's the biggest thing in front of you. So we have this little tagline in our organization, always look for the T. Just look for the T. You never know where it's going to come from. So some of the best ideas, some of the best approaches and strategies have come from these conversations and people thinking, and it's all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, there it is. You know, and it's really neat. So we do try to keep them connected and keep offering that support and checking in um, because one of the issues they deal with is peer pressure. We'll have ranchers start working with us and things are going well. They get beat up by their neighbors. You're working with those wolf people, how dare you? And then they'll flip. Not only will they pull out, but they'll start bashing you and telling other people, you know, and they create drama. Um, and it's unfortunate because sometimes it gets in the media and it's just, you know, so that happens, right? And you have to kind of recognize that, the peer pressure. But anyways, looking for the T in everything you do. So.